So, uh, well, greetings from Pakistan and good to see that there are students here, although virtually, but uh, I'm, I'm just so pleased. And thank you, Shazare and Nandini, for really, you know, allowing me to be here with you today here. So, um, uh, today my title is dealing with climate change, climate migrants in disaster preparedness, because it's all to do with housing. And housing is something I think all of us need to be concerned with because there's a huge number of people who are shelterless today or who are homeless today. So it's a good idea to maybe just think about that a little bit. So, uh, but I don't know how many of you might have attended my talk yesterday, but I did not wish to repeat myself too much today. There will be some slides that I will repeat, but not many. And so I thought I should focus on climate change and related issues as this concerns all of us, wherever we might be. Because as you know, uh, uh, the disasters that are overtaking all of us all around the world, they're increasing every year. And uh, you know, the strange thing, of course, is that now donor fatigue is setting in because before you could get funding, but now it's becoming more and more difficult because there's so many disasters and hum I mean, there's only that much you know, in, the, in the kitty. So we need to find ways as to how we can handle them. So we know that as architects, we must try and lower the carbon footprint. That's another issue that I wanted to highlight again in all buildings that we design and whether for the privilege or for the disadvantage. I mean, even for the privilege, I think the time has come to lower the carbon footprint. Why should we do all these spectacular buildings which are, you know, which have such a high carbon footprint because they use so much of steel and concrete and materials that are highly energy consumptive. So at the same time, we also know that homelessness has grown enormously in all countries. And I'm sure you will find homeless people in New York as well. Well, I've seen them in your country. I've seen them in uh, San Francisco and also in Los Angeles. And I don't know about New York. I haven't been there for some time, but I'm sure that you, you will have a lot of them there too. So I did want to also discuss issues of human rights as well, because architects need to work on ways to help in achieving rights as well as sustainable development uh, goals or SDGs. You might've heard of SDGs. They're very important for us because all of us need to work towards them. There are 17 of them uh, and uh, all countries have endorsed them. So just that as we have ratified various covenants related to housing and rights, all countries have accepted that everybody has a right to housing and affordable, comfortable housing. So I'll just, try to see if I can start my uh, my presentation. Please just bear with me, okay? Uh, uh, I thought I had got it sorted out, but I can't see my presentation here. So Climate Migrants and Disaster Preparedness, this is the title for the, for the talk today. And I just wanted to really emphasize the diverse cultural heritage that we possess in Pakistan. Uh, and the slide that I showed yesterday also, because this is to demonstrate the importance that traditions and heritage hold for me. And um, I feel that maybe others should also look into that, whatever there is uh, in, with, in each country. And I think that may lead us towards the right direction. So um, uh, I feel that they not only shape our lives, they also point the way towards sustainable practices. Um, and so you can see what a wealth of heritage my country possesses. I won't go through all of it, but you can see there's tangible heritage, there's intangible heritage, and there's also the vernacular heritage, which a lot of times is actually ignored. So, and then there's a slide I wanted to show you about disasters in Pakistan. Um, uh, my, my country is fifth uh, most vulnerable country in the world today with the disasters that we face. And almost every year, as you will see, we've been conf confronted with either earthquakes or, or, uh, or floods. And I might just tell you that um, all over the world, almost 50% of disasters are water related. So we all have to be thinking about it as to what we should do in terms of withstanding and, and finding uh, and really preparedness and also designing in a manner that we can, that the buildings can withstand these disasters. So, um, so these calamities have resulted in enormous displacements and a large number of climate migrants who, who even after a decade of the disaster are still seeking shelter and a better quality of life. They still don't have what they need. So many of them being displaced uh, have become climate migrants with no hope of going back to the original location because if they're displaced, they can't go back for whatever reasons, either the land is not uh, any more uh, uh, useful or, or uh, it's inundated or uh, because every year you might get uh, flooding so people can't really go back unless we find a solution and architects actually find solutions to a lot of foreseeable disasters, I believe. So. Um, 
uh, mostly now we see, uh, you know, how do we really, um, so let me see where am I, yes. All right, so there are different ways to really, um, uh, you know, work at it in their stages of it so we can do mitigation. So these can be structural, which are flood defenses or strong buildings, non-structural, which is disaster management and regulating public education and so on. Preparedness is very important. So there can be warning systems, there can be precautions, there can be preparedness, and of course, prevention. I mean, there's always possibility of preventing to a certain degree. But of course, the largest issue is climate change impact, and we all have to work towards that elusive figure of 1.5 degree centigrade that every country has agreed that you know everybody will contain. Uh, the rise uh, uh, in in terms of emissions to that to that degree. So we all have to play our part in this uh, in one way or the other. So these are uh, climate migrants are those that are affected by sea level rise, extreme events, drought, water scarcity, earthquakes, fires, all kinds of disasters. And it's expected that by 2030 there'll be 230 million that will be displaced, but by 2050, 19 countries or 2.1 billion, which is 25 percent of world population, will be displaced unless we start taking mitigating measures or we start sort of designing for them. So um, now we see that there are many urban centers which are already groaning from the pressure from hinterland, will now witness unprecedented stress related to job availability, substantial increase in poverty levels leading to increase in crime along with rise in domestic violence, further proliferation of slums with overcrowded housing, lacking both physical and social infrastructure, increase in incidence of disease, lack of security, and also greater vulnerability. This is what's happening to our, our city centers, many of them, especially the ones uh, which keep on uh, being confronted with disasters. So worse is that climate migrants or environmental refugees, as they're also called, have no rights which are available to refugees suffering from uh, persecution or conflicts. I mean, that's another big tragic uh, uh, fact that we are not really bothering to look at. And even though safe, stable, and affordable housing is an inalienable fundamental human right, this growing body of mostly impoverished households do not appear to have any hope of attaining reasonable living conditions. They're all out there literally without a roof over their heads. The same applies to homeless population in many countries. I mean, what is happening or what we are experiencing in Pakistan, I believe it's happening in many, many countries otherwise as well. So I just thought I'll just show you this very quickly, uh, you know, the human rights issue. And uh, there are several uh, commandants that uh, most countries have signed uh, the, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights that is 1948 that originated actually, you know, in New York in the at the at the UN headquarters and Eleanor Roosevelt was the, the, the leading light in that. And then this Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Racial Discrimination of 1965, then International Covenant on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights that was 1966, then Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of discrimination against women, uh, that again was 1979, and Convention on the Right of the Child, so, and 1989. So these are all these covenants that are there, and countries have signed, but it's not, you won't find that much attention is being paid to the rights as they have been enshrined in these covenants. So uh, now uh, we come to this, uh, you know, why is it important that we avoid displacement and that it is something that can be done to a great degree. I know there are possibility there. Sometimes the severity is so great that you cannot really do much about it. But the fact is that a lot of time you can really uh, design in a manner that, that, that people will not be displaced. And uh, I just thought I'll just show you what Filippo Grandi had said just uh, last year at Glasgow. I think it was in December uh, that COP26 was held. And he said, and I quote, we need to invest now in preparedness to mitigate future uh, protection needs and prevent further climate caused displacements. Waiting for disaster to strike is no longer an option because there's too much displacement going on, which has a huge economic loss. Uh, so we need to avoid it with strategy for disaster preparedness and safe building practices for building sustainable, safe and affordable construction. And this is what I wanted to highlight and say that this is something that really we should all be thinking about. And then um, there's this Hugo framework, which you might have heard of or not, which was supposed to have been implemented by 2015, but most countries have not done much about it. And you can see that, you know, what it says is pretty logical that it should be taken as a local and national priority. And we need to assess and monitor disaster risks and enhance early warning systems so that people can start preparing and be ready for them. And we could use knowledge and innovation and education 
to build safely and resilience at all levels. And resilience is something that is a word that's used a lot, but I find that uh, uh, a lot of times uh, it's not really taken seriously. And uh, we have to reduce, of course, the underlying factors. I mean, this is something that we all have to work towards, which means lowering, at least lowering the carbon footprint, and then to strengthen disaster preparedness for effective respective levels and so on. So I just thought I'll just share that with you so that you might like to have a look at it in, in greater detail sometime later. And then while I've been working in all these years since um, the last 16 years in the humanitarian field, I believe architects can play a significant role in designing alternatives for disaster preparedness and post-disaster rehabilitation, both are important. And so I've designed some principles for communities to deal with disasters, and I've been using it for the last several years now, which is to use heritage and tradition for fostering pride and self-confidence, to use number two, sustainable materials for, to prevent environmental degradation. That again is important when we build. Thirdly, use local skills and techniques for speedy delivery. Uh, they say that if you have pre prefabrication done in factories, you can do it very fast. But I found that, you know, when you build, a lot of people are taught how to build safely, they will also do it very fast. So we don't necessarily need the very high tech ways of, of working. And fourth is incorporate DRR driven. I don't know whether that you're familiar with the term DRR. It means disaster risk reduction. And this is used a lot in the, in the humanitarian field because we are dealing with disasters all the time. So everything we do must be driven by these concerns and the methodologies that will allow withstanding of the next disaster. And then fifth is utilize provision of shelter. And I, this is my, my uh, you know, technique. I use my Pakistan Chula, the one that I showed yesterday. And um, maybe I'll show it here as, as well, as, uh, today as well. It's an earthen uh, stove. And uh, that gives us entry very easily into communities because we work a lot with women. And it's really for women that they, we are, we're really, uh, uh, really want that they should have dignity in their lives. And somehow the Chula, this raised platform of the earthen platform has provided them with that. But the women have been so impacted by that and they've you know, raised the level of their, their respect in the, in the community that they, they allow us now with, in any village where they build the Chula, I can walk in and I can start anything I want. So we need to find ways to be able to get into communities. And the sixth of course is, um, develop uh, holistic models aiming at SDGs, uh, hygiene, wash, uh, food security, nutrition. There are so many issues and we need to have a holistic model where we can do all of that. So um, now I just thought very quickly just to run through. On the left is Mohenjo Daro, the uh, you know, 2,500 year old uh, Bronze Age uh, city, uh, uh, which is, you know, which is built in 500 BC rather not this is now 5,000 5, year old. So um, this is, is all built on platforms and urban platforms. And so that's how it's protected from any kind of floods. And so I've, de I've devised always, um, you know, um, uh, buildings and, 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 and platforms so that people are able to um, be able to take refuge at upper level. So whether it's the roof or whether it's the platforms for cattle, for human beings, for everybody. And this is possible at a very low cost. And then I'm repeating this particular slide because I feel that I want to um, you know somehow everybody to think about this that you know, these are these materials that are so important for us and we can use them uh, wherever they are available easily and they will bring the cost down and at the same time uh, they are literally zero carbon footprint so it's something that the so use of affordable and system sustainable materials is just so important and then uh, local skills and techniques and here you see these women because they're working in earth so they're used to all their lives they've molded earth they they know how to how to shape it they know how to design it they know how to make patterns out of it and you can see how beautiful they they decorate their own houses and so the local skills should be maximized. We can improve them, we can train them better, but certainly I think the basis could be what they already have and they do. And then these are the DRI driven methodologies, uh, safe structures. You can see it's all a, it's an earth, uh, um, um, you know, the sun dried brick, uh, brick wall with lime and mud uh, uh, plaster and the render, and the roof is just bamboo. And uh, uh, it is uh, something that's very safe in floods and as you saw in the earlier slide, you can climb on the roof and you can find refuge. So we have to find ways by which it's all DRR driven in some way. And then, as I said, use a shelter in earthen Pakistan chula. This is the, the chula, the stove, uh, and you can see how um, the women 
you know, they make them themselves. They are taught by what, what my, what I call my barefoot entrepreneurs who go and teach them how to build them and then women make them themselves. So they are all self-built, they decorate them, they make them really beautiful, and then they use them for all kinds of purposes. So this is what allows me to go into any kind of village where they've taken this on. It's all spread by word of mouth. There's something like 70,000 have been built and they've been no cost to anybody. The people have done them themselves. My only cost was when I trained my, my teams to go on the, the barefoot entrepreneur teams who went and did it. So lots of very low cost methodologies can be uh, can be adopted, can be used for, for helping the poor. And then, uh, uh, as I said, a holistic model, this was a village, and I, I don't know if you can see the bottom of the slide, which showed how everybody lived in this particular village. They were, these are villages of beggars who are, uh, are begging at the, at the heritage site of Makli, the world heritage site, where there are lots of shrines, Sufi shrines as well, where people come and give a lot of alms and charity, so there are lots of beggars. And so we decided to work with them and you can see how you can transform if you are focusing on some basic needs that they have. And so uh, then I want to show you this. I showed yesterday as well, the zero carbon channel. There's something like 24 of them. How can you actually build sustainable and safe housing? Very low cost by yourself. So step by step, you can learn. You can have them all on your cell phones and you can actually do them. And this is how we train um, these young people in, in Bangladesh and also in universities in Pakistan who will be going to London in the in Granary Square near King's Cross. They will build the, the log, the, the Larry of the Green. So uh, these are these I find that these are really having an impact. And this, of course, is the versatile log panel. I just wanted to, I showed it yesterday as well. I don't know if you saw that. But this has been very, very popular and very useful. It's very strong because of the shape, but also because it's all with bamboo. And uh, you make a, a room or you can, you can uh, these are with eight panels, but if you, and roof can be anything. It can be thatch, it can be any kind of board. And then uh, if you add on two more, you can have a longest room, which is about 24 feet long and about uh, 12 feet wide. And, and you can fill it. The filling can be anything like stone or whatever is available. If you add another four panels, then it becomes an, a kind of a, uh, an octagon, and that's about 18 foot by 18 foot. And you can put a dome over it as well, so it gives a very nice and very lofty kind of feel about it. And this, again, is modular, so you can add on more. And that's how you can just, it's, it's incremental. Everything that I do is incremental because that's how most poor people have to work. And then uh, I wanted to show this as well, which is a, the two logs uh, built in, in Islamabad. Uh, and uh, they are urban logs, the same, the same basic panels have been taken and then you can see that it becomes something that is, you know, that urbanites can enjoy. This was done by, by young students, uh, architectural students and also many, many architects. And then uh, I just thought I'd show you this one. This is an incremental uh, uh, urban uh, house, again, using the same uh, basic uh, prefab panels, but you can see that you start with one room and a you know, toilet and, and then you add on a veranda, you add on a staircase and you can add on another room. So it's all incremental. Again, the same kind of uh, uh, strategy that people can build as they earn money because it is very important that we allow people to be able to expand as they want. And then uh, just, I, this is my last slide. I just wanted to show you, and there is of course, architect John Turner, who's written this amazing book of, of our housing by people and which, you know, talks about, about uh, self-help construction, these are the 20th century visionaries, uh, you know, that are really, uh, who propagated self-building and sustainable methodologies and low impact, low tech procedures. And then, you know, so please, uh, sometime when you have time, do read up on John Turner. And then uh, it was all um, half a century ago. Uh, and then, uh, you know, it's amazing uh, what they thought at that time. And I think there's much that can be learned from them and maybe use it. And then there's the economist, uh, Fitz Schumacher, sorry, um, who is uh, uh, you know who wrote this book called Small is Beautiful that fostered the use of minimal technology in all activities to be driven by morality and ethics. Sometimes you forget that we have to be ethical in the way that we actually practice architecture also. And then of course there's the critic Iman Illich and uh, uh, you know he's a social critic and who wanted who warned us about the environmental damage caused by industrialization. And we should really think about that. So these are the real visionaries who identified ways to save human values and foster dignity of humankind, as well as pathways for environmental conservation. Uh, and let us hope a majority of you will be mindful of social and ecological justice 
whatever you design and we'll also find a way to serve humanity. And my last slide is use the three zeros that I talked about yesterday, zero cost to donor, zero carbon and zero cost and uh, zero waste and leading to zero poverty. So serving the displaced and the destitute through co-creation and low tech, low impact methodologies. So thank you very much. This was my, my presentation. Now we can go on to the discussion. Yes, so um, with the solution that you've proposed, um, how would you see that working in a place such as New York City? And if you had to make modifications to your model, what would it be? If I if I had to make what? Sorry, say it again. What modifications you to your, Modific your model uh, or your proposal. Oh, oh right. Well, uh, I don't know really, you know, um, I really don't like to offer my comments for a for a an area or a context that I'm not too familiar with, but I do know that uh, poverty levels are quite high in many places. And I know that COVID-19 raised in certain areas of New York uh, quite uncontrollably. And obviously that's because uh, they did not have the, uh, did not have any access to really a healthy environment. So obviously that densities must be very high there. And I, I do feel that, uh, um, for families, uh, multi-story housing is not the answer, but I think it's really uh, not at all good for children and for women to be cooped up within these blocks. And I think that's why maybe, um, uh, I mean, I don't know whether there's any studies done, but I think a lot of crime and everything happens when people are cooped up in this manner. So I would really change the way um, these cities are planned. I would, I would like to have them more low rise and maybe kind of medium density and maybe less cars and maybe more open spaces. So there could be a lot that could be done even with the environment that you do possess. But uh, everybody has to work out their own way. I think we have to be clear about certain principles, what we, not, what we want for people and not for machines and for the cars. And then you'll find your own way. That's why we need young architects working in these fields. So I hope you'll take it up. I read a question in the chat from Abram Morris. How can architects utilize these indigenous and low-tech design strategies without stealing credit for them? Without stealing credit? Well, you know, uh, once you design um, or you start building in this manner, then it's no longer your design. Then you have to forget about how you were trained. I mean, we were trained, we are always, as architects, we are trained to be have to have total control over everything. And uh, I remember when I was acting as a high-flying architect, I, nobody could mess around with my building. Nobody could change anything. Nobody could even make us the slightest of, of, of difference in what I had wanted. But now, um, because I'm working with people, so they're the ones who lead. I mean, I just give the, I often say this like a canvas that I provide. And then people put in their own colors and they paint them in the, the way they wish. So it becomes a co-creation. It's no longer my design. It's no longer my creation. It is co-creation. They are equally, um, uh, uh, equally they, they, they can claim to be the, the, uh, the, you know, the designers for that particular uh, product uh, as I would. So, you know, I think, uh, uh, sorry, so sorry, I just put it on. So, um, you know, I think, I think we, have to, we have to think in a different manner. You have to forget about your ego, first of all. So anybody who can do that can work with communities. Um, uh, Mubina. Hi, Mrs. Lari. Um, so my question is regard, oh, sorry, I'm sorry, one sec. My question is um, about how us as young architects can get involved in um, these kind of causes. I'm asking mostly from personal experience where I've tried to go, I've gone back to Bangladesh a few times. I've um, tried to get involved, but there's a lot of barriers that comes with us as young designers who are, even if you're going back to your home country, there's not really a system set up for us where we can actually participate and get to know what issues are happening, how we can tackle those issues and like, how do we educate ourselves and how do we, like, what, what is your suggestion on that? Yeah. <laughs> yes, Mubina. Well, um, welcome, because I'm so happy that you are from Bangladesh. We just had such a good interaction with Bangladesh, with the BRAC University just last month, actually. 
and the kids from BRAC and other universities will be going to London. Six of them will be working together with Pakistani students to build this log and along with six UK students. So it's going to be a wonderful cooperation. The problem, of course, is that in all our countries, um, architects are still practicing um, in the way that they've been taught in, in you know, wherever they, were, they studied. And uh, still there are not many who are working in the humanitarian field. So that's the big issue everywhere. Uh, but yesterday we had a little discussion and maybe uh, Dr. Marta Gutman might say something on this because we talked a little bit about how maybe universities and institutes of architects, for instance, in all countries and even, uh, and I think maybe uh, Professor Shazari might also have something to say on that as to how maybe practices can help in finding opportunities or giving opportunities to young 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 architects to be able to set up uh, you know either practices or or do some hand holding or provide some funding where they they are able to work on these these issues because as young architects you will need that initial help without it i don't think you can manage it and all of us who are who are working in this field who are concerned i think all of us have to work towards it i don't have an answer for you yet but we are working on it so maybe in a year's time, I might be able to, if you refer to me, I might have an answer for you. Okay, okay. thank you. <laughs> Sorry about that, yeah. yeah I, feel, I feel rather responsible because I, you know, I talk about these issues and I don't have an answer for these young people. And that's my biggest concern right now, actually. Let's see, sorry, yeah, carry on. Harry, you wanna ask your question? Yes, hi. Uh, thank you, Yasmin, for your wonderful talk. Um, my question so is, for is regarding the um, maybe the aesthetics of your project. So, in some of the slides, with the bamboo, you've you've sort of created this um, tapestry with a pattern that that um, references some of the the designs from the local traditions. And I'm wondering how important do you feel that is to the project? Is is it? Do you see that as something more of like a luxury if there's time, or do you see that aesthetic choice as kind of integral integral to the the whole project yes harry i think it's a very interesting question you raised um i think we have to be looking at architects in a different manner now because architecture is not just what architects design there have been lots of uh, studies and books published on uh, you know architecture without architects also and uh, i feel that uh, you know because I've done a standard unit, right? Like we all do, uh, which is uh, either in earth or in, in bamboo. But when people build, then they personalize those. So really each one becomes different. And I think that is, that is the success of it because people then own it and then they take pride in it. And that's what I want people to do. So I'm, I, I'm not concerned whether my structure or my, uh, you know, the, my concept as it was, whether it's fully there or not, I know I want that it should be safe. I want that it should be uh, built properly. But beyond that, whatever they want to do with it, I'm happy if they do it because that's how people want to live. I mean, we can't restrict people to be confined like all of us were taught at one time that, you know, you tell people how they should live. But I don't think the world is like that. And uh, I think we should allow everybody the opportunity to be a creative, to bring about their own kind of, uh, you know, whatever their own feelings are, because they're the ones who are going to use that house or that building or that structure. So I'm very happy when they personalize it. I mean, the 70,000 uh, stoves or the earthen stoves that have been built there, each one is different. You'd be surprised, Harry, the amazing creativity that's there. You have to come and see it. Each one is different. And uh, some French magazine, Le Monde, I think, called it a, a, a called it boutique uh, stoves or something, you know, because each one is just so so different from each other. Yeah, I'm you agree with that? You agree that people should be able to have their choice. I'm what read is your question, feeling? A yeah. question <laughs> from the chat from Asiali that is related uh, to to Harry's question. Do you find there is any hesitance from people to engage with the indigenous designs or materials due to the potential stigma that they may have? If so, how do you approach and work past that? Yeah, I, absolutely. You are just so right that uh, uh, we've always looked down upon uh, what is vernacular, what is folk, and you know this always this question of what is high art and what is low art. And, and so, because all of us who are educated feel that we know better. So we need to impose our own ideas on people who are not so well uh, placed, 
I might say. So um, uh, I think we have to change that whole thing. I feel very strongly that uh, uh, people have an innate uh, creative creativity and an urge to express themselves. And I find in Pakistan, women are absolutely, it's amazing what they've learned, uh, which has been passed on from generation to generation because there's so much pattern everywhere. And it's, uh, you can see it repeated in, in architecture, even in earlier times, and also in fabrics, in tapestry, in, in printing, in all kinds of things. And uh, uh, I didn't realize myself that, you know, when we built, started to build in mud, how, how they could transform that, you know, very simple earth plastered wall into a thing of beauty. So uh, we have to change the way we look at things. And the more we encourage them and the more we begin to understand them, I think more and more there'll be appreciation of all this, uh, but it'll take time, I think. It'll take time. Hi, Mrs. Lari. Uh, my name Hello. is Sarita. Hello. And Hello. hi, yes. And my question to you is, we read about your passion in housing the poor and finding architectural solutions towards social good. So what would you say is the architect's key responsibility when it comes to social relationships and designing? Because there's so many dynamics to yeah. this aspect. So how do you start when you're doing a project? Well, Surya, it's, it's, it's a very tough thing. It's not an easy path to, to really to traverse. Huh? You have to, um, I think you have to find your own way as to what you feel, feel is fulfilling for yourself also. How much do you go into this? Um, I think that uh, I feel myself that a social goal is very important because I think uh, in today's world, we cannot close our eyes to kind of disparities that are all around us now and uh, all kinds of issues that are there which have been ignored or papered over or just, you know, turned a blind eye. But I think it no longer is possible to do that because there are too many who suffer from, you know, all kinds of injustices. And uh, I feel that architects have a different role to play now. And it, of course, every age has a different, I mean, every age uh, throws up a different role for architects, I think, you know, and, uh, uh, and of course, we've had amazing, uh, uh, you know, sort of amazing giants in architecture who've done what they thought was the best at that particular time. But for our time, we have to find our own way. And it's not my time anymore, because I'm long past that, it's your time. So as young people, you have to see what you can do to change the perception of architects and architecture. I think it's got to change, right? So you have to do it. Thank you. Yeah, okay. Gia, uh, you, want, you want to go next? Hi, Mrs. Larry, my name is Gia. Um, I have a question about um, women in Pakistan. I, I know that um, you're very famous I'm from China. Okay, all right, good. Yeah, okay. Um, China and, China and Pakistan have a very strong bond, you know that. Yes, I was just about to say that. <laughs> okay, all right. All right and, good, yeah. yeah, I just have a question about a uh, Pakistani woman. Um, yeah. I, I know that you're very famous globally and also famous in your country. Um, and I found that your experience is very unique compared to the other people. Um, I'm just wondering, because it's, the other day I was searching your name and uh, I was searching woman and architect in uh, Pakistan, your, um, and you, you jump, your, your name jumped out like first couple pages on Google. I was just wondering how, um, like a, the other, is there any younger generation for a woman architects? Like, uh, is there anything like that exists in Pakistan? Is, do you guys have any architecture schools um, uh, have women or is there any other uh, uh, ar uh, woman architect just like you to, um, do such uh, like very amazing things. <laughs> That's very kind of you say that. I don't know whether I've done much amazing work, but I have, I think I've just followed, uh, I just followed my conscience basically actually. And I, what I thought I should be doing, right? Mm -hmm. So, and I've been lucky. I've been very lucky all my life. I've had a support system that I needed. I've, uh, uh, I've had so, so many opportunities because Pakistan has so many deficits that wherever you plug in, you can do things, okay? and. 
whatever came my way, I took it. And as I said, I'm just very lucky. But having said that, I have to tell you that today, majority of schools of architecture are full of young women. Wow, uh, that's they're, really they're, amazing. They're, many of them, I don't know, I think there may be about, gosh, there must be about 40 or 50 schools of architecture in the country. And uh, I mean, I just happened to be the first one. I did not know I was going to be the first one. I arrived back in, the, in my country <laughs> and I found that, you know, there was nobody else who would graduated at that time. So again, I was lucky, right? And then also when you become the first and you carry a lot of responsibility, so you have to do the right thing all the way. I mean, that burden is with you and you must do it mm -hmm. because how, I mean, you know, otherwise what's the point of your being the first one if you don't do the right thing, okay? So, uh, so you, you, you carry that and I hope that I have delivered. I hope that I've brought, uh, you know, I respect to my profession and respect to women because a lot of time in Pakistan, women are not given much credence and they are not expected to do very much. But I think that uh, women are very strong and there are so many now who are doing amazing things. Young women, they're pilots, they're flyers, they're uh, mountaineers, they're all kinds of, you know, women who are going up. And so I'm very proud of them and uh, lots of women architects. And uh, I, I don't know, I somehow, I think people find it a little bit strange that I should have given up my, my um, you know, what they call star architecture to become, you know, now architect for the poor of the poor. I think that's what probably drives, you know, whatever people want to know about me. And maybe others have not had that chance, but there are many women who are very eminent, who are doing extremely well and who, are, who do design with great sensitivity. So uh, there are lots of them in Pakistan. So you have to, all, all of you have to come over to Pakistan to change your perceptions, okay? <laughs> okay, <laughs> thank you very much. All right, yeah, okay. Kevin? Uh, yeah, hello, Mrs. Lari. Um, so I know I that, that Karachi has a very hot and dry climate and that uh, yes. passive cooling you know, is, is key to a lot of your designs. What uh, changes in your designs for colder and wetter places, you know, like up in the, in the mountains in Pakistan? Yeah, uh, yes, good question. But I, I have to tell you, Kevin, that um, first of all, insulation is the most important one because that works both ways, whether it's a, you know, a hot climate or cold. And my structures have been put up uh, in up in the north where uh, it's mountainous terrain, where you get lots of snow actually. And uh, I don't know what you, what you know, but if the snow sets in uh, somewhere it stays there, it also creates a lot of uh, insulation actually. So uh, it's good to encourage snow to be on the roof. So the roofs have to be very strong. And uh, basically uh, because the bamboo structure is a four, four inch, uh, 100 mm diameter uh, you know, section that is used. So what you do is you put a lining on the two sides. And so it creates an insulation, it, it creates a void in between, which provides the insulation. And uh, uh, if, you, if you really uh, use uh, um, uh, any kind of uh, cover and then cover it all with, uh, with uh, earth and lime, uh, you really get very good, very good values. So it works just as well there too, uh, both ways it works. And of course you can have other, other um, uh, techniques also where you want to bring in the cool air where you have the wind catchers and so on, they can be incorporated. Uh, and so on. So there are always ways to juggle with the same form and the same kind of technique, the same construction technique, uh, but make it comfortable because that's the key to everything. You, you have to create a comfortable habitat, right? But the more you experiment, the more you will know. Unless you do it, you won't know, right? Makes sense. Thank you so much. <laughs> All right, okay. Dave? Hi, Mrs. Larry. Thank Hello, you so Dave. much for um, your incredible work and sharing it with us. Um, I was thinking about Portland cement and you were talking about its devastating impact on the environment. Um, and with your material approach using mud and lime and bamboo, um, how do you get around having to burn the lime in kilns or is this just something that's always been unnecessary to the material? Uh, very good question, Dave, because this is something that we have to really be looking into. Uh, but you see what happens in Pakistan is that it's burnt in this uh, small kiln. So the, really the emission is very little, comparatively speaking. And yesterday I did show a slide as to uh, how much carbon emission there is uh, or how much energy is consumed with all these materials. And steel and cement are way higher than anything else. And we also know the studies that have been carried out that because of the use of such materials like cement and steel, uh, something like 40% uh, 
of emissions are because of that. So we now know that for a fact, it's not something that is being said anymore. And uh, because you want to now lower the emissions, then certainly uh, lime, uh, even if you were to burn it in, the, in, in you know, your countries, even then it's something like half the emissions of, 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 uh, of cement. And also you know that before, uh, uh, almost before early this century, although cement was invented, Portland cement was invented something like middle of 19th century, but it really became popular the turn of the century, right? So before that, of course, lime was used everywhere. I mean, you, you, you find it in aqueducts, you find it in our, uh, you know, forts and everything. So why is it that we can't go back to lime? Another interesting fact I must tell you, which somebody told me, I was giving a lecture, I think was it Basel uh, University and in, in Switzerland. And this gentleman who is the teacher there, who uh, teaches material, he said that now that they're trying to lower the carbon content in steel, there's a lot of lime that will become available. So maybe this is the time for us to really popularize it because it will become now probably quite, uh, quite economical to use, even in the West. So I would suggest to you that you should start using. What do you do, Dave? Are you are you practicing? Are you what do you do? What are you teaching? I'm I'm a student, um, a first year architecture student, but I'm also an artist um, and a teacher. So oh, okay, right, right. So so you should try it out and see. Why don't you take some lime and uh, mix it with earth and uh, you know let it dry in the sun, and uh, and then you know maybe just use a ratio of maybe one is to five or one is to four and uh, you know let it dry for about a week 10 days and then put it in soak it in water and you'll see the result i will thank you so much that's great all right good thank you marta thank you so i i was about to say i'll see the floor to or the room to students but i do want to come back to the question that rubina asked and, and Yasmin, you, you, you asked me to, to weigh in. And so I, I think there are, as I see it, uh, I think the questions that Movina raised are profound. You know, how do we, how do we make space for, for people like us in practice? And I, I don't have an easy, and, and I also believe what do the schools, what responsibilities school, architecture schools have in that, in that role? And I think um, myself, I think we can, create incubators at architecture schools. I think architecture schools can also argue at this point, architecture schools like us, we're looking for money from firms to support students with scholarships and internships, but we can also make the case that firms need to set up pro bono, uh, firms that are making lots of money on commercial development uh, can set up pro bono uh, departments within their within their firms, I think we have to make that case quite strongly. I think we also need to follow our students as they leave school and move into practice and, and make sure that our students are supported in the kind of work that they wanna do through a mentorship. I think it's a super, super important project for us. And I think now specifically at Spitzer. And I also think that there is a way in which we can nurture and not only nurture, but really, um, perhaps demand a new attitude towards design in the way we structure design studios, uh, for sure. And I'm very taken with your slide, uh, Mrs. Laurie, in which you show the incremental construction of one of, those, one of those houses, showing the initial unit, the addition of a porch, the addition of a second story, the growth of the veranda, uh, and the like. And this so resonates with the research I've done on the way women build and the way women build for children in particular, particularly people who are pressed, uh, who are, are not, don't have access to big bucks, right? So there are, I think if we work in our studios, for instance, to think about the value of a first imprint rather than a finished design. And I know this is a way that uh, Professor Bakshi operates is in sympathy with me on this, that we may, uh, we can make progress in the mentality that our students bring into, bring into, bring into practice. So, uh, but that's, those are some thoughts initially. I think that would be amazing, Marta, if you were to start there, but I know that if you do it, you know, if one university takes it up, I think others will follow. And yeah. uh, I think, as you rightly say, if you can create incubators and there were, uh, I mean, listen, there's so much money everywhere in every country. I mean, my country is supposedly poor, but there's just so much money that's misused all the time. And I think in the capitalist system, particularly, the money is really 
frittered away, it's thrown away quite a lot. But also I think what you have is a very strong tradition of philanthropy, actually in with all different kinds of corporations. And uh, I think um, uh, you know, there's, there's something like impact funding, which is to do with either cultural, social, or, 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 or uh, ecological kind of concerns. I think the money could be available, especially if we are talking now of climate change and how we are trying to fashion architecture to be able to um, you know, withstand um, or, you know, or mitigate the, the, the impact that's having. So or if you were to uh, perhaps to, you know, design it in that way, then I think funding will be available because uh, the whole world is today concerned as to how do you build now where, you know, you will be able to contain carbon emissions. So uh, I think that'd be wonderful. And whatever I can do, um, I'd be happy to, you know, uh, sort of uh, help in any way that you want. It'd be a great pleasure. Thank you. I'd like that, yeah, sure. That'd be nice. Agreed. Arna, you want to take the next question? But Cesare, I, I thought you might say something about the idea yeah, that you I, had about. I, <laughs> yeah, my, so if, if I may, so I also had that. So essentially, it's a, a similar comment to, to Marta. So it's essentially thinking also as a teacher. Um, and uh, the, the past few days, I've been looking in particular at, uh, I've been looking at, at your YouTube channel. Uh, those uh, instructional videos on how to use uh, uh, earth, lime, uh, uh, bamboo. Uh, that I'd like to hear more, in fact, of, of those strategies. But more generally, like, uh, but for me, the question is: uh, so, how how do we rethink architectural pedagogy or architectural education? So, and I think there's something that needs to be done within schools, uh, and and uh, and perhaps also within in practice itself. I think the idea of a pro bono system yeah, as it exists yeah. for uh, lawyers uh yeah. so corporate firm that in fact have managed uh, to devote the portions of their of their work uh, to uh, to other causes i think uh, it could be implemented uh, or i wish it could be implemented in architectural firms but it's mostly i'd, I'd be curious uh, uh, if you uh, if you had a particular suggestion for how you would restructure for example studios or uh, certain portions of architectural education. Yeah, yeah. Well, first of all, I think uh, you came up with this whole idea about pro bono uh, and and the work that lawyers do, and I thought that was very interesting. Something that should be taken forward, because I think there may be some practices who actually uh, are interested in 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 in, in uh, you know thinking about such issues, and they could really create a wing within their uh, very flourishing uh, practices where they could help young people to to work on those on those particular aspects. But I think every uh, every architect should really now think about how they can begin to, as I keep on saying, work towards the other 99% uh, as well, or whatever, with my country is about 80% that I think need that kind of help. So I thought that, that, that the thought that you came up with was very interesting and we should pursue that. And maybe we should be talking to the institutes like, I don't know, AIA and so on, and I'm talking to the RIBA now, and let's see if they, we can make a roster or a um, a kind of, um, uh, you know, a database of, of practices who are interested in this and then try to link up with universities and others and see how we can do that. But I think that could be possible. And then, you know, the question that was raised by, by young people, I mean, they're obviously concerned. They want to get involved in other ways of practicing architecture, but they don't know how, obviously, because the practices, the current practices do not allow that. And unless we all work together on this, they will never have a chance. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, so let's let's work on it, yeah. That will be very good. Excellent. But that we'll discuss later. There'll be a long discussion as to what we do with universities in terms of doing practical work. I think most, most of the time I find that there's not, there's not very much going on in terms of hands-on work. So maybe, I don't know about your, your university, but many do not have any hands-on work for students. But maybe that's a good idea sometime. Dirty your hands. I don't know. I'll have to think about that. Yeah. Aparna, you want to go? Yeah, thank you. Um, thank you, Miss Laurie, for your lecture. It was um, truly enlightening. And I love what you said about uh, decolonizing architecture and like the way we approach it. Um, am I stuck? Like, great, oh, great, yes. Yeah. Yeah, great, so, where are you from, Kanya? Where are you I'm from? I'm sorry? Oh, where, I'm, where uh, are you? Uh, right yeah. now I'm in New York, but I'm ethnically Indian. Yeah. yeah. All right. Okay. Um, 
So my question, I, I think I have two parts to it. One is, do you think the application of um, bamboo and mud uh, can be uh, used with like long span structures or larger buildings? Because I saw the Mockley Cultural Center and I think that's kind of in the tangent of that. Or is uh, your approach more towards uh, single family houses or smaller units? And also the second part is, um, you talked about refugees, and I was wondering, like, when we looked at ref look at refugee camp designs, those are more temporary in nature, and uh, they're usually tents or like a bamboo structure. But I'm wondering, do you think your uh, design would be applicable in um, that kind of scenario? Um, yeah, just uh, wanted to hear your thoughts on that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, very interesting question you've raised, of course. I mean, you see, I think. Well, first of all, I must say that I'm using bamboo and earth and lime because it's easily available in my country. I don't know what is available in other countries, but you have to look at it. And uh, I just want that whatever we do, we should uh, use materials that have a very low carbon footprint or zero carbon, if that's possible, but low, certainly lower than cement and steel and other materials that are used normally. My focus is, you're right, absolutely on on uh, on, on families, on, on poor, on the poor. So my everything I do has to be lowest cost. Okay, so I'm costly cutting corners, but it has to be safe. So the buildings must be strong enough. The Makri Center, of course, is expensive. Uh, it's a very large structure, it's like a hangar. Uh, it's huge, and but you can see that we could do it in bamboo. It's all bamboo. There's just nothing else that's been used in that, right? So it's possible to do it. So you could do even larger ones. Now, I know that in Southeast Asia, there have been some very amazing buildings that have been built with bamboo. So that is done for people who are richer, who have got more, more funds and so on. And I think what I would really like is young people like yourself to be designing for the rich also. You don't have to design only for the poor. It's that I've taken on this because this is my special concern. But you could be designing for the rich and also design with materials that are low carbon and make them something fantastic. And why not? That's perfectly OK. So that's why I want more architects in the field and working in these materials. And then you will do the more spectacular work. Because I've done my bit in the past. I don't want to do that anymore. OK, but you, you should be doing it. Now, the second part of your question was about the refugees. I have to tell you there's this log that I showed you, the bamboo panels. I designed it as temporary housing for people who've been affected by an earthquake in the north in 2015. That's how I designed it, actually. Because before that, I'd used the cross bracing, but all in situ. And then here I thought we have to get there. We have to give them an alternative because the tents were far too flimsy. It was very, very cold and they had to have something that would be, you know, stronger. So we just uh, made them by some youth, you know, who were, uh, who were really volunteered for this work, although we, they were paid, but they were all otherwise just sitting around doing nothing. And they were all, all kind of brought into this. And then they were all sent off, these were put onto a vehicle and sent off to these areas. And then later on, I found that this is something that's very useful in, in general construction as well. But these are really, um, these, are, these are kind of panels that you could actually uproot and take with you. So I don't know whether people who are living in the West understand, but are certainly in the subcontinent, uh, in all Bangladesh, in India, and in Pakistan, uh, uh, there is hardly anybody who's got the tenure of land, they don't, they don't possess land. The poor do not possess land. So my, uh, my advice al always to them is you make the structure in bamboo and if somebody wants to uproot you, you'll take it all with you and put it up somewhere else. Because they always somewhere else is available. So uh, if you put it up, it, it, can be, it can be permanent if you were to finish it off properly, but it can be just as well you know, taken off uh, because it's just a light prefab structure, right? So it works both ways. So you have to you have to find ways to navigate through this whole system that is full of injustices. So how do you do this? That's another thing that architects have to learn in, in our part of the world, learn to do that. Yeah. It'll take time, but you'll get there. You'll do it. I know. Right. Thank you. It's really encouraging to hear. Yeah. Sure. Nandini. Yes, hello. Um, thank you, Yasmin. Larry, for that wonderful presentation and all your thoughts. My mind is just kind of swimming with what I should ask at this point. Uh, so I'm a professor 
at City College. I've taught here for a while, but I actually started my architectural education uh, in a town called Pune in India. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, you just take me to a place right now uh, where all these sort of memories of my own uh, trajectory as an architect are evoked. And I- I'm just so proud of you for how you have transitioned uh, over the course of your career, sort of going through back, having a practice that was more in line with what, you know, was expected of you than having to face these earthquakes and disasters and changing your tactics. One of the things that struck me most about um, what you presented is you talked about, you you have this phrase, ways of getting into the community. I really think about that a lot myself. Um, and I, I think of your chula as one of those very tangible things that you, you kind of came up with. And so now you're welcome, as you said, in all of those communities. So that's one takeaway I have for the students who are listening in is like, if you're if you're interested in this work, you know, think of something really concrete, and uh, it may not be the most sort of fantastic piece, but in a way, it might be the one that allows you that entry point. Because unless you know how to enter into it, what do you do? And the question that I want to ask you is: at the moment where you sort of transitioned, let's say, from your career where you were doing. Um, a lot of, let's say, private commissions to this other humanitarian work, or even the way in which you went back to think about heritage. So it's not about the materials that you use that we could also use. It's really about your strategy of going back to, uh, through history, through research, through to vernacular practices, and then looking at society. Those are things that I think our students could take away. But could you outline for us, you know, what it took for you once you decided that you wanted to do this type of work? You know, did you call up a bunch of people you knew? Did you apply for grants? Did you go to agencies that were providing monies towards disaster relief? Could you give us a snapshot into like a two-month action plan that you set up uh, to change your career towards this work? Okay, Nandini, very difficult question, but you come from a very famous city, huh? Pune is so well known and, and amazing, really. So, um, well, you know, <laughs> and my life is kind of organic growth, okay? I've never really planned much somehow, and uh, things have been happening. And uh, the only thing I've done is that I've just taken up any kind of challenge that that came my way. I did not stop and say, well, you know, maybe I shouldn't do it. I just said, well, I think it's something that it would be interesting. So let me just get on with that. And uh, as I said earlier on, I had a very strong support system, which is very unusual uh, for women in countries like mine. But I had it. And uh, and I also think, that, you know, some of us have been blessed and been very privileged in so many ways. And we somehow don't feel that, don't, don't, don't think about it enough because that itself places you in a position where you don't have to worry about so many things, you know? And so uh, I, I was just lucky. And then I decided to give up my, my practice because uh, I wanted to write books as it happened. I have written some, but I would like to write more. And then the earthquake, earthquake happened actually. Uh, I, I thought I'd done enough and I felt that I was just getting, you know, I just thought this is not, not okay for me to just carry on in the same way. I thought writing books was more important for me at that point in time. And then uh, the earthquake happened. And actually before that, um, UNESCO got in hold of me and, they, and uh, I was their national advisor at the Lahore Fort where I learned the use of line. So you have to see by the sequence that it's nothing that I designed, it just happened to me uh, step by step and maybe fate had it for me, I don't know. Because I'd never used line before and here I was in the Lahore Fort, the spectacular thing that I was actually writing a book on and that's why my husband encouraged me to take it up, he said, you'll at least finish your book. I never did finish the book, but I enjoyed being in the Lahore Fort. And I did earn, a, I did learn a hell of a lot about using lime and other materials that were used in the fort. And so then earthquake happened and I just upped and I went up there. And it was very, 
strange because I'd never done that kind of work before in my life. I'd never known what humanitarian work was, you know. I'd done some work in some slums, I'd done some earth building, but nothing much really. And I had no money, so my husband gave me 500,000 rupees, said, well, this is all that, you know, he thought I'll just go and come back within a month or something. And you have, you, you won't believe the kind of help I got, the number of volunteers I got from all over the world. You have no idea how I, just incredible. I mean, this field is so amazing and uh, it's so rewarding and people just came to help. And it just, I just am stuck there even now. It's been so many years, 16 years now, because the doors just open for you. Everybody wants to come and help you. So, uh, 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 well, now, of course, I've changed path. I used to take a lot of grants and money, but now I'm taking only grants for training. I, I've decided no charity for anybody, neither for our, our organization nor for the people. And I think that's a much more honorable way of doing it. So we are just training and uh, uh, letting people do it themselves. Uh, so it's, it's been a longest journey. I've learned a lot in the process. I had to, as I keep on saying, I had to give up my ego. And uh, I think I've become a better human being. I think I'm enjoying myself much more than I ever did. And I'm not working for those who really, really don't need me. I mean, they could do, do very well without me. The, the, the rich don't need me. And so it doesn't really matter. And I, I must say, uh, I must tell you that uh, I've designed the largest building of its time, 750,000 square feet of area in Karachi is called the Finance and Trade Center. Lots of steel and concrete, but maybe 2,500 people use it. It was the most expensive building of its time, granite and all kinds of things. And then I've done this chula. I designed the basic one, but as I said, it's a co-creation. Cost only a couple of thousand rupees, which is nothing. Uh, it's hardly a few dollars. And uh, uh, 70,000 families are using them, which means something like 700,000 people have got the benefit of it. So that is the difference between what you do for the rich and what you can do for the others. And I'm much more proud of the Chula than I am of my financial trade center. I can tell you that as well. Although I enjoy that. I mean, it's also nice, but that's okay. Yeah, <laughs> all right. Matthew. Hello, Mrs. Lari. Thank you for Hello. your wonderful talk. This has been Hello. a Thank great you. few days of uh, learning. Um, I just wanted to ask you about some things you said yesterday in your talk. Um, yeah. You kind of have been alluding to it in a few of your responses today, but you said that it's necessary to bypass every state organ because no government in the world is willing to solve this problem and that it was necessary to find a place to settle people and teach them to help themselves. And right. I just wanted to ask you to expand on that a little bit more because it kind of resonates with some of my own experiences here in America where, for example, in the aftermath of Hurricane Katrina, the government failed to do its job in providing relief for for that um, that population. So you know we and and these are that was a climate disaster maybe the first big one that we had in america in this century and i just i would just like to hear more about if you've encountered hostility from the government or indifference or or what can you just talk more about that mm -hmm. so matthew you you you're based here in new york and and you you live in new york Yes, I live in Brooklyn. My family is from Trinidad, Trinidad and Tobago. So, okay. all right, right, good. So, uh, yeah, well, um, tricky question to answer, Matthew, because um, um, it's it's. Uh, I mean, I I don't know. My experience with the with the state has not been very um, very good in the sense that I find that they are oblivious to the to the state of the poor in the country. And uh, uh, it's true for many of our, uh, uh, you know, what we call the South Asian states and, and also in Sub-Saharan Africa, where so-called the developing world, where uh, uh, corruption levels are very high and uh, uh, people who can, uh, who can take advantage, they'll take every advantage regardless of what's happening in the country. And, uh, and so I've witnessed that for the longest time. And, uh, I feel that the state uh, of poverty and, and homelessness and, and, uh, and, and disparities would not be so great if the governments were mindful. 
and uh, uh, I've of course found people who are supportive in the government, but they, but I, we don't take any any assistance from government in terms of any funding. I'm happy to uh, get facilitation. I always do. That's not a problem, and there are always good people everywhere. So that is there. But I think that the more we'll empower people, the more we'll get the results. Even in Hurricane Katrina, uh, I know that lots of uh, very important um, designers went there and tried to design some fantastic kind of structures. Uh, but that was not necessarily the answer to what I think the people wanted there. So the more we empower people themselves and are able to find ways. Now, my way is for the poorest of my country. But I don't know what level of poverty there is in your country, for instance. And you have to find a way to see how you allow people to be able to uh, not necessarily to start going and building themselves, but allow them to have control over what is built. Uh, and I think if you can do that, then also I think it will make a lot of difference in getting the right kind of product for them. Because a lot of times we give people who've gone through any kind of disaster what we think is good for them. But that's not necessarily true. I've seen it again and again. Uh, it, it, it's something else that they need. And they're the best ones to articulate that. So they're the best ones to decide how they want to go about it. Do you see what I'm trying to say? And, and, and that's what you need to do in every place. Uh, but with me, I think, you know, in, in my country, I, we've got millions that are homeless, that are shelterless today. Millions, literally, you know. And why is it that they don't have it? Uh, so if I can empower them, and uh, now I'm finding a way. Uh, the first time it's happened that um, a small amount of 50,000 rupees, which is what, uh, $20,000, uh, $2,000, I think. 2,000 rupees, about $2,000, I think. And uh, that's all that is needed for a family to be able to put up their own house. No, is it how much is this? Sorry, let me, I'm always confused with the dollars, you know. But it's 50,000 rupees. So if you divide that by 200, let's say 260, how much would that be? That's all that there is. That, that's, that's all that is needed for each family and they, they make their own houses themselves. They don't need anything else, you know? Divide by 270 actually. But sorry, $200 is all you need, $185. So that's all that's needed for each family to be able to build. If they get the loan, they'll repay the loan and they'll just build themselves with my videos that Shadra is talking about. That's all we need. So you have to find your own way, of course, in your own country as to how you can best get to those people. But there are many different ways of, of doing it. I mean, there could be lots of permutations, right? So we, I think we are, thank you, Yasmin. We're, we're getting toward the, the end of time. In fact, we've gone over what we asked for. So we can take two more questions. Chaser, is that where we are or? Yes, uh, so let, uh, Kenya and Elena, uh, so Kenya, you want to go first? I just, I just would make one comment to Matthew, and that is that if you're eager to see a group of artists who are acting on the principles that Yasmin just described um, in New Orleans, take a look at the recording on our YouTube channel of the Black School Project, uh, and you'll, um, you'll find folks who are doing following exactly her model, but in, in, in a Southern American city, so. Nice. Thank okay. you. Yeah. Thank you very much. Welcome. Hello, thank you, Yasmin, um, for your contribution to architecture and to, for opening up the conversation uh, for us today. Uh, so my question is actually similar to Matthew's. Um, so in previous interviews uh, and today, you mentioned the state's systemic injustices and inadequacies uh, regard regarding the basic human need of um, housing. Um, and you did offer uh, several solutions like the YouTube channel um, for like guided self-help um, and synergistic building practices uh, and, and, and co-creating. My question was also kind of related to government and not necessarily government's current role, but how, um, if, if, if you have in the past, um, maybe collaborated with government, not for funding purposes, but maybe for for policy making, for policy changes that would allow for a more uh, systemic approach and and system for for all the, you know for the for the co creating for the synergistic systems and and like the circular um, the circular building environment. Um, so if you have done any any work like that, 
Um, and also, um, if you, you can think of any policy change, um, which you, you actually just spoke to right now, um, the policies that, that can be created, like the loans. Um, uh, <laughs> but I'm also in New York and, and the system is, it's a lot more restrictive and there's a lot more rules and regulations. And that's why I feel like um, my question is more towards policy and, and how we can uh, create change that way, or if it's even effective to do so. No, Kenya, you're absolutely right. If you could bring about a policy change, nothing like it, because everybody starts following it. The problem is that um, the bylaws don't allow a lot of things to happen because people, the bylaws were created, I don't know, some decades ago, and uh, uh, they were not thinking in the, in the same way about climate change as we are today. Uh, and so uh, the policies are still kind of antiquated, I feel, and there's not very many people who are working to change them. Uh, government is very conservative always, and they don't want to take up any kind of uh, uh, new initiatives unless everything is absolutely safe. So for instance, uh, we had this, um, uh, uh, the government had announced that they'll be making 5 million houses and special authority was formed and uh, the chairman especially had a special meeting because he heard me speak on some television channel when I said, you know, uh, again, I said, well, I don't think we should be looking at government to do anything because they will never take it up because the channel, the person, the anchor asked me whether the new authority had been in touch with me for the poor. And I said, no, they are not concerned about it. And they will, I know they'll never do it. So he thought he'll take up the challenge. He spoke with me, a whole lot of them. And then finally, they came to the conclusion that no, they could not take a risk with these materials because they were not known materials. So, uh, and here they are putting up enormous amounts of money, but as, as you saw, I need only about $200. And that is difficult for them to allocate. They can give uh, hundreds of thousands of dollars to people to build, but not this $200 because it's far too risky. So government, the problem with the banks and government is that, that they find that this is not, the, it's not you know, business as usual. And why should they take the risk? Now the poor I know are the best you know, wants to return any loans. I mean, Grameen Bank has showed that in, in Bangladesh, most countries where they've tried, it's, it's happened that poor and women particularly always return the loans. So it's no risk really, but uh, it's been a struggle for me to get this first loan, but I'm now hoping one bank will give it and more will follow. But the government per se is not bothering to think about this. I have talked to several, but they are not really interested because they can't even see the poor. I mean, it's amazing how the poor are mostly kind of, you know, hidden away from all of us. We don't see them, actually speaking. And a lot of people in my country are even scared of the poor. So they will never talk to them. So uh, it's, it's a big issue. And so I, I, I'm not at all hopeful of bringing about a policy change anywhere, really. Not in countries like mine. But maybe if you guys try now in... in, in you know, because I think there's more uh, respect for for getting the right policies in countries like yours, and maybe you know it should be a try that you should, guys should try to see if we can bring about some sort of a change, because it will have to be done sometime. You know, mm -hmm. if somebody can start now. That that's very good. That'd be great. Thank you, Elena. Um. Okay. Hi, Mrs. Zadi. My name is Elena. Um, thank you so much for meeting with us, uh, especially two days in a row. Um, it's been eye-opening. Um, so I think many of us, my peers and, and myself, do have aspirations of, of a, humani a humanitarian career in architecture. Um, right. So the question I have is a concern of these aspirations, certainly something I'm conscious of in considering future work. So. Um, to what extent do you feel authenticity is necessary in design? You design in Pakistan with local materials and local or historic vernacular. Do you find that that is most helpful in garnering support by the very people you're trying to help? So you suggest that architects act primarily regionally um, in, in the region. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right, Elena. It's got to be regional because you can't impose anything from somewhere else to any region. And uh, But the more it's rooted among the people where uh, uh, it resonates with people in some way, that is where the success would be. So uh, wherever you are, you have to build according to the terrain, according to the 
you know, whatever the cultural scenario is, however the people are living, what are they used to, and so on and so forth. There are lots, I mean, this is all that is taught to you actually when you're designing. I mean, these are simple things that, that you learn uh, in your universities. Uh, it just now is up to you that, you know, you, you veer towards the, as you said, the humanitarian work, and then you just, just have to take those lessons and change your focus, that's all. But the same principles apply whatever you've been taught. And then, you, but as I said, you know, you, you, perhaps you have to think about tradition a little bit more than what is taught normally. And you have to see how, what will be useful for people, how, how would they react to it? And also not to impose anything on them because that will not work. So I'm not saying that my model is something that should be taken everywhere. I don't think that's a good idea. But I do think that, for instance, my bamboo structures are flexible enough that they can be modified. Like the Bangladesh, uh, uh, you know, these young uh, people who build the, the, the one in, in, in Dhaka uh, was transformed into a, into a Bangladeshi unit, although the basic structure was the same. But the way the materials were used, the way the small additions were done, whether it was the, um, the overhang or, or whether it was the way the way the thatch was put in or the way the finishing was done and the way the women wove the matting, I don't know what it was, but it, but it became different from what it was in Pakistan. So that's what I aim for, that whatever one does, it should be really suitable for, the, for that particular context.